Review for Geometry Topic 8 Exam Section 1. Before we get into the questions that are on the exam, I have here the formulas you need to know for volume. Make sure you look at this before the exam and that you're familiar with how the formulas work. So here are the formulas for volume and then here are the formulas for the surface area. All right. Again, make sure you look through them and that you under understand how to use them before the exam. Section 1 has 12 questions. Question 1. What combination of geometric shapes can be used to best estimate the volume of the shape shown below? Okay, so the shape that's shown is a combination of two shapes. It should be obvious what they are. Uh, the first shape is a cone. Okay, and the second shape is a sphere. If you combine them, you get the object, the figure, the composite figure that's shown on the left. All right. So it's a combination of a truncated cone and a truncated sphere. If you don't know what truncated means, I wrote it right here. Truncated means without its top or end section. All right. So it's a combination of a truncated cone and a truncated sphere. Question number two. The cross-sectional areas of the right prisms shown below are equal. What relationship exists between the volume of the two figures? All right, so um, it says, and this is very important, this is a key thing, a key part of the question. It says that the, uh, the cross-sections, the areas of these cross-sections shown are equal. Okay, so the area of this triangle equals the area of this rectangle that's the first thing you need to notice okay so if their areas are equal that means the area of their bases are also equal because the it doesn't it doesn't really say it in the question but they should have written this in the question okay but basically this cross section is parallel to the base that means that they're exactly the same so if the area of this cross section equals the area of this cross section that means that the area of the base of this triangular prism equals the area of the base of this rectangular prism. Okay, now let's look at the formula for the formula to calculate the volume of a right triangular prism and the volume of a right rectangular prism. Basically, the formulas are exactly the same in both of them. You got to multiply the area of the base times the height. The area of the base times the height, right? Okay, so we already know that the area of the base is the same in both of them. And look at the height. It says H and H. That means that they're the same as well. Because H stands for a number. So if they're using H here, that means that the height is the same in both of them. So what does that tell us about the volume of the two figures? The volume of the two figures is going to be the same. All right? Because if the height is the same in both figures, and the area of the base is the same in both figures. When you multiply them, the volume is going to be the same. All right, so the volume of the two figures is the same. That's what I wrote down here. Okay, question number three. This may look complicated at first, but if you if you read through it, and I'm going to show you a way that we could uh, make up an example, it'll make sense, and it's actually not not difficult. Okay, it says. A certain cylinder has a height of HC. H stands for height and the little c uh, stands for cylinder, okay? So that means the height of the cylinder. A certain cylinder has a height of HC and a certain square prism has a height of HP. Again, H stands for height and the P stands for prism. That's how you could keep in mind what we're talking about, okay? Now the circular cross-section of the cylinder and the square cross-section of the prism have the same area. Which equation express, expresses the relationship of the volume of the cylinder, VC, volume of cylinder, to the volume of the prism, VP, volume of prism? Okay, I know you're, a lot of you are probably looking at this and you're like, huh? All right, so hold on. And listen, especially for my top students, all right, or, or it's for everybody, but especially for the people that regularly pay attention and try, 
when you encounter a question like this, you're not the only one thinking, huh, sometimes I read this stuff and I'm thinking the same thing. And I want to show you how you could figure this stuff out and better understand it. Whenever you run into this situation when, where you don't fully understand what the question may mean the first time you read it, okay? Uh, I've mentioned this before. What you should do a lot of times is make up an example imitating what they're saying with very easy numbers and it allows us to see things more clearly, all right? So as I wrote here, to better understand the question, let's make up an example with easy numbers. All right, so they're talking about a cylinder, right? All right, here's my cylinder. And they're talking about a uh, square prism. Here's my square prism. Okay, now, what's next? Uh, what did I... Hold on. All right, it says here that they both have... It says right here, right, that... Um, their cross section, the, the, I'm sorry, the circular cross section of the cylinder and the square cross section of the prism have the same area. This is just like the problem that we saw a second ago where you had a, um, a cross section, right? And a cross section here, sorry, I didn't, I'm not drawing it that perfect, but they said that the cross sections were the same. They had the same area in both of them. So that means that the area of the base is going to be the same in both of them. The area of the base is the same in both of them, all right? Sorry, I have like these nice drawings, but uh, I should maybe I should have put a cross section here. Whatever, I can, I'm not going to do it now. But the point is, because of that, that means that the area of the base is the same in both of them. Now, where did this 10 come from? I made it up, all right? It's just a random number I put there that's easy to work with. I said, okay, let's say that the area of the base in both of them is 10, but I made up that number. I made up the 10, right, to, to make it, to make an easy number for our example, okay? Um, okay, now it says here that the heights are different. How do I know that the heights are different? Because this one says H of C and this one says H of P, all right? So their heights are different. So I just put random numbers here. Listen, you could have put whatever numbers you wanted to as long as you make them different. But I want to make numbers that are easy to work with, easy to calculate, all right? And I know, like, I know what I was going for, so I put 5 and 1. You could have also put 2 and 1 or 1 and 2, whatever you want. It, it would have still allowed us to, to, um, to see what I want you to see, which I'm going to demonstrate in a second, okay? So I'm just putting these random numbers because they're easy to work with, all right? Um, okay, so how do you get the... Um, Hold on, I'm sorry. Uh, how do you get the volume of a cylinder or the volume of a prism? You multiply the area of the base times the height. So in both of them, I got to do, in this one, I got to do 10 times 5. In this one, I got to do 10 times 1. All right, so to get the volume, we multiply area of base times height. So for the cylinder, this says volume of cylinder equals 10 times 5, which the volume is 50. For the prism, you do 10 times 1, which the volume is 10. Okay, now... Let's compare, let's compare what we have here, okay? The volume of the cylinder in, with these numbers is five times greater than the volume of the prism. And the height of the cylinder, which I made five, is five times greater than the height of the prism. Okay, so the correct relationship out of what's here would be the volume of the cylinder over the volume of the prism equals the height of the cylinder over the height of the prism. Okay, let me explain it a little bit further because I'm sure some people are still like, huh, how do you come up with that? Okay, so look, I looked at the answers, right? And I had an idea what it, what, that it was probably going to be this one. I'm sorry, it's this one right here. Okay, first of all, let's look at it. Let's look at this answer so that at the very least you can understand how you could identify the correct answer, okay? This one is comparing um, volume to volume, height to height. On the top you got cylinder, on the top you got cylinder, on the bottom you got prism, on the bottom you got prism. This is the correct answer. Okay, this one is comparing the volume of the cylinder to the volume of the prism. And then here it, it's, it puts it backwards. On the top it has the prism, on the bottom it has the cylinder. You cannot do that. It's got to be the same thing compared to the same thing, okay? Now, getting back to like how I came up with these numbers. Again, they're random. But let's say, let's say you would have put instead a 2 here and a 1 here. Okay, then it would have been a situation where it's the volume of this one is 20 and the volume of this one is 10. 
and the height of this one is two and the height of this one is one okay basically everything here is double this one this relationship still would have been the same except this would have been a 20 and this would have been a two but my point is to try to illustrate um how this relationship works that the volume of the cylinder compared to the volume of the prism will equal the height of the cylinder compared to the height of the prism even if you do different numbers as long as you keep the area of the base the same and put two different numbers for the height the relationship would still be um this relationship would still exist it, it won't be five to one it'll be a different number to one but it would still work all right that's what i'm trying to show you with this relationship all right so the key concept to take away is that the volume of the cylinder compared to the volume of the prism will equal the height of the cylinder compared to the height of the prism. I hope I didn't confuse anybody by adding those numbers. I, th I think by adding the numbers, it should make it more clear instead of just having these vague letters here and trying to make you make sense of the letters. I think when we add numbers, it makes it a little more clear uh, the relationship that we're trying to look for. Um, and again, I'll say it one more time. Even if you don't fully understand this, you should because I think it's pretty simple, especially if you've been doing the homework. This should make sense to you. But let's say it doesn't. I explained to you how you could understand it even if you don't understand with the numbers that I used. It's comparing the volume of the cylinder to the volume of the prism equals the height of the cylinder to the height of the prism. The same shape has to be on the top and the same shape has to be on the bottom. All right. I can't make it any more clear than that, guys. All right. Let's move on to question number four. All right. The figures shown below all have circular bases with a radius of r units okay basically that means that they all have the same radius not that it's really important right now but uh but they well i guess it does matter okay they all have the same radius because it says they all have, have a radius of r units the four figures have equal heights which figures if any have equal volumes okay so they all have a radius of r because it says they all have a radius of r units so that means the radius is the same for all of them so out of these shapes which ones have the same volume okay well these two are going to have the same exact volume oh and by the way i forgot to write that they all have the same height they all have the same height that's important as well um the height is the same in all of them Okay, so if the radius is the same in all of them and the height is the same in all of them, then the right cylinder and the oblique cylinder will have the same volume because the, the formula to get their volume is the same. And these two right here will also have the same volume. That's important to know that both of these have the same volume and both of these have the same volume. Remember what I always say, if I'm putting something in my review, it's because you need to know it for the test, all right? So make sure you're aware of that. That's not difficult, but I'm just pointing it out. All right. So that's what I wrote down here. The volume of the right cylinder is equal to the volume of the oblique cylinder. And the volume of the cone is equal to the volume of the oblique cone. All right. Question five. Valeria is filling the pool in her backyard with water. If the pool is in the shape of a cylinder with a diameter of 14 feet and a height of six feet, how much water is needed to fill three-fourths of the pool? If you've been doing your homework assignments, this should not be hard. Okay, so okay, so to get the... Uh, first of all, we have a cylinder. All right, The pool in Valeria's backyard is in the shape of a cylinder. So I'm using the formula to get the volume of a cylinder. And at the end, after I get the volume of the cylinder, at the very end, I'll get three-fourths of that volume all right we'll deal with this at the end first let's get the volume of the entire cylinder okay so the formula for the volume of a cylinder is area of the base times the height and to get the area of the base you got to multiply pi r squared times the height so that's going to be pi times if the diameter is 14 let me let me try to draw a pool it's in the shape of a cylinder that looks more like a, a a bowl but whatever um, it says the diameter is uh, 14 feet so that means the radius is always half of the diameter the radius is gonna be 7 feet alright so that's why I put a 7 there 
And it says the height of the pool is six feet, or the height of the cylinder is six feet. All right? And we're going to leave our answer in terms of pi. Okay, so when I multiply that, I get the volume of the entire cylinder or the entire pool, which is 294 pi, 294 pi uh, square, uh, cubic feet. I forgot to put that, but whatever. 294 pi cubic feet. Okay, now here's the deal. They don't want to fill up the entire pool. The question is how much water is needed to fill three-fourths of the pool. All right, they only want to fill three-fourths of the pool. So this is basic middle school math that everybody should remember. Okay, if I want to find three-fourths of something, I got to multiply three over four. Of means multiply. All right, so whenever you want to find a fraction of something, you got to multiply the fraction times whatever that something is. In this case, that something is 294 pi. Okay, so to get three-fourths of 294 pi, I got to multiply three over four times I changed 294 pi into a fraction by putting a 1 on the bottom. So multiply the top times the top, and you'll get 882 pi on the top, and the bottom times the bottom. 4 times 1 is 4. Now divide 882 by 4, and you get 220.5 pi cubic feet. Okay? Um, so that would be the answer. On the test, the question is basically the same, but with different numbers. All right, follow my steps and you'll get the correct answer. This should be easy, not difficult. So there, that would be the answer, all right? Moving on to number six. Sorry if that came out a little bit small, but there's a lot to write. Um, a bakery sells gourmet cake pops. All right, this question, make sure to read it before because it's not really a difficult question, but the way they wrote this, this little story here is like, is like unnecessarily confusing. This is one thing I hate about exams. Like they use stuff that's like, who even talks like this or whatever? But all right, it says, a bakery sells gourmet cake pops. Each pop is composed of a spherical ball of cake atop a paper lollipop stick. A jumbo cake pop has a diameter of eight centimeters. What is the volume of cake in a spherical ball of cake baked for <laughs> I'm sorry what is the volume of cake in a spherical ball of cake baked for a jumbo cake pop I feel like I'm re reading a riddle or something okay uh let me try to translate wh what what it said there okay basically it's some bakery that sells like a sphere imagine a sphere I know this looks like a let me, it's kind of hard to draw something 3d I don't know does that make it look 3d I don't know that's supposed to be like a reflection or something. All right, this is a sphere. Or maybe I should go like that. Uh, let me try it again. All right. <laughs> All right, so this is a sphere. And, and let me try to do that thing. All right, that, maybe that makes it look maybe like that. All right. That gives the optical illusion that it's a sphere. All right. Um, so it sells these little pastries, all right, that consist of a spherical, a, a sphere, which is a ball of cake on top of a paper a lollipop stick. That's I don't understand what they mean by that. It's made out of paper? What? I don't get it. But whatever. Let's just pretend there's a, a stick here, okay? Um, so a paper lollipop stick. Okay, now it has a diameter, all right? The diameter is... Uh, personally, this drawing... I think this drawing is coming out pretty good, <laughs> considering I'm just, like, improvising here. Uh, it has a diameter of 8 centimeters. What is the volume of the cake in a spherical ball of cake that's baked for a jumbo cake pop, all right? All right, so all this unnecessary, confusing language here is basically asking, what is the volume of this sphere? Okay, that is the question. What is the volume of this sphere? All right, so realize if the diameter is 8 centimeters, that means that the radius has to be 4 centimeters. Okay, um, so... I got to use the formula to get the volume of a sphere, which is that, all right? That's the formula to get the volume of a sphere. So when I substitute 4 for radius, 4 to the third power is 64. Now multiply 64 times 4 over 3, and you're going to get that answer. But I got to point out something very important on this. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It's not this question. I'm sorry. It's not this question. It's coming up later. 
Um, so when I divide that, this is my answer. Approximately 85.3 pi cubic centimeters. Oh, wait, wait. It is this one. I'm sorry. It is this one. I got confused. Okay, please listen to what I'm going to point out, all right? This is really important. Okay, this is for my little example here, imitating what's on the test. This is the correct answer. Notice that the correct answer has pi there. Okay, now look at the issue I found on the test. On the test, they forgot. They forgot to put pi in all the answers, which I cannot believe, all right? But that's how it is on the test. The correct, like let's say this was the correct answer. On the test, it would say 85.3 without the pi, which is wrong, okay? So I'm just pointing that out because it's like that on the test. And um, if you mess up, that's on you because I'm telling you this in advance. So for the people that don't bother looking at the review or studying or, or forget, that's your fault, not mine. I'm telling you in advance that the correct answer is missing pi on the exam. Okay, how do I feel about that? This is how I feel about that. That's how I feel, guys. Guys, I'm trying to make this a little, a little, uh, add some, some razzle dazzle to your, your videos slowly. I mean, so far, this is like, like, these are some weak special effects, right? They'll get better. <laughs> but, um, I was honestly, I was actually looking for an emoji with, for the, for SMH, like when you put your hand on your face for that emoji, but, uh, apparently they don't have that in PowerPoint. So I had to go with this and I had to figure out how to make him, make him, uh, shake his head. All right. So I guess in the end, I did do SMH. All right. Um, all right. Moving on. All right. Question seven. This is a super easy question that's on the test. Right. It says basically just look right here. A right triangle rotated around the line. Wait, I'm sorry. Basically, uh, I'm sorry. Let's look at this first. It says describe and then sketch the figure that is generated by each rotation in three dimensional space. So the question is basically this. If you have a right triangle and you rotate it, imagine that you're rotating this triangle in a three-dimensional space. Like, let me see if I could draw it so that it makes sense. Like that. And, you know, continue. Whoops. Hold on. Wait, I got this. Like this. And then look at that. Oh, yeah. Optical illusion, guys. Like that. You're rotating it like that. Why did I draw it though? I should have drawn it. Hold on. Let me let me try it one more time. Like that. And like and like that. Magic. All right. So if you're rotating it around this axis, all right, line L. All right. If you're rotating it like that, you're going to get, I hope you realize it's going to create a, a cone. All right. Its rotation is in the form of a cone. This is what you have to make sure you know, all right? That should be super easy, guys. I mean, if you get that wrong, I don't know what to tell you. But yes, that's actually on the test, man. That's how easy it is. All right, moving on. Okay. I know we went over the section on cross sections, right? And I told you guys, guys, this is so easy. You can't mess this up. But then I looked at some of the questions on the test, and they threw some curveballs at us that that I didn't realize because this was not in the book. And the curveballs are this. They're asking questions about if you, if you, all right, first of all, let's look here. If you draw, if you do a cross section horizontally parallel to the base, that's called a horizontal slice. All right. I know that wasn't in the book, or at least not that, that terminology was not in the book. All right. But a horizontal slice is if you do a horizontal cross section, that's parallel to the base. Now look over here. A vertical slice is when you do a slice that's perpendicular to the base, right? Vertical is up and down, so a vertical slice is perpendicular to the base. Those two are easy, but the curveballs are right here. If you do an angled slice, like if a cross section intersects this three-dimensional shape, which is a triangular prism, at an angle, what are the shapes created, all right? You're going to need to know that for the test. I put 8A because there's 8B right behind it that I'm going to explain the same thing for a different shape, okay? But for a triangular prism, which is what we have here, okay, I want to make sure that you're familiar with what shapes are created, what cross-section shapes are created when a, when a plane intersects a triangular prism. So if you do a horizontal slice, you get a triangle. If you do a vertical slice, you get a rectangle. 
And if you do an angled slice, you could get a triangle. And de or depending on the angle, you could also get a, tra this is a trapezoid. All right, let me write that here. Trapezoid. All right, so just be familiar with the different shapes that could be created in a, with a cross section of a triangular prism. You're going to have access to my review, all right? So it's not like I don't want you to memorize it. I just want you to look at it and make sure you understand, okay, there's a horizontal slice, there's an angled slice, and I can look right there to see what are the shapes created, all right? So I'm not trying to make you memorize this stuff. I just want you to have a visual idea what it could look like. Um, and keep in mind, for, for the district test, you're going to have access to my review. But for the geometry EOC, you do not have access to my review. You're going to be on your own. So you got to be able to visualize stuff like this, all right? There's more of these questions coming up in this review, okay? And by the way, a shout out to this website, which is awesome. I actually use it all the time. And I was, I actually spent like, I don't know how many hours trying to find pictures like this on the internet and nothing. And then I, I, I happened to check on this site, which I should have done it earlier. And uh, I found this and I was like, like, whoa, this is awesome. I actually was able to, like, they have a thing where you could manipulate the plane to make it look like this. And then I took snapshots. But this is an awesome website. All right. So anyways, just giving a little credit to them. <laughs> All right. Um, so 8B, same exact thing, but now we have a rectangular prism. All right, this one, this one is actually pretty easy, right? This one's not difficult. It's all pretty much the same, right? So again, here I have the horizontal slice. A horizontal slice is parallel to the base. Here I have a vertical slice, which is perpendicular to the base. And in the middle, I have if you do an angled slice, but they all basically create a rectangle, all right? They all create a rectangle. But on the test, they're going to be asking you, hey, if you make, um, there's a question that's asking you, like, if you do an angled slice on this shape, what do you get? Or what can you get? And you need to be familiar with these, right? It's like a question that has multiple parts to it, right? With what I'm giving you, you'll be fine if you make sure to look at it, all right? But, but again, if I'm putting something in my review, it's because it's on the test. I'm not going to waste my time. I'm not going to waste your time, all right? I'm trying to prepare you for what's actually on the test. All right, question nine. This is another easy one. This question is just like, um, to go back a second, whoops. Sorry. This question is just like this one that we just did a second ago about the cone. This is the same thing, but with um with a circle. All right. The question is what shape what shape is formed when a semicircle is rotated around a line containing its diameter? So this is the line containing its diameter. If I rotate this semicircle like this, like that, and then like like that, all right? In a three-dimensional uh, space, <laughs> I almost said space. I was, I was getting ready to say sphere, and I said space, all right? Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, if I rotate that in a three-dimensional space, I'm gonna get this sphere, all right? So make sure you know that. Again, like, how can you get that wrong, especially since it's on here on the review? All right, but I'll bet anything there'll be people getting this wrong, trust me on that. All right, so let's look at number 10, all right? Okay, number 10, match each building with the geometric shapes that can be used to model them. I want to point out, look at the letter S there. I put it in bold and I underlined it. Shapes, plural. That means there's more than one answer for each picture. Make sure you realize that on the test, all right? Geometric shapes, all right? These are the answer choices right here. You can only choose from these answer choices. All right, so let's look at our first picture. All right, this is a composite figure made up of two shapes. Look at the top. Okay, first of all, we can't tell. We can't tell if the base is a triangle. We can't tell, like the base could be a triangle. However, if you look at the answer choices and it's like this on the test, there's no triangular prism. So that eliminates that possibility because it's not one of the answer choices. So really, it has to be a rectangular prism and a and a rectangular um, a rectangular pyramid. Hold on. A rectangular pyramid, right? Sorry, I got I got thrown off by the. Um, it's at a different angle, the top from the bottom, and that threw me off. All right, but it has to be uh, on the top a pyramid. 
okay, on the top a pyramid, and on the bottom a rectangular prism, all right? Now let's look at this building right here in the, in the middle. Um, so this consists of two shapes, this composite figure, all right? Look what we got in the back. In the back we got this part, all right? That's gonna be the your rectangular prism, but look at the front, okay? The front is uh, half a, a sphere. Hey, hold on. Is uh oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I almost got I almost got confused there. Um, not half of a sphere. I misspoke. I'm sorry. Half of a cylinder. All right. I'm sorry. I was uh temporarily confused. <laughs> All right. It's half of a cylinder. Okay. So the two shapes that make it up. All right. Or the two geometric shapes that we could use to model this building would be a rectangular prism and a cylinder for the half cylinder that's in the front, okay? Um, and then for the last one, here we have three shapes, right? We have three sh shapes um, involved. First, well, let's look at the top, what's that, all right? If you look at that, this part is is in, in the form of a kind of circular, all right? So that tells us that this is, it's not a pyramid, it's a cone, all right? Because it doesn't have any sharp, sides any sharp edges all right so it's a cone the top the blue part is a cone okay these parts right here would be a cylinder okay and then this part in the middle consists of a rectangular prism all right so there are the answers hopefully you should find that easy i, I think that's really easy all right nobody should have an issue with that as long as you remember that Again, it's geometric shapes. It's plural. There's more than one shape for each one. That's the main thing to remember. Um, okay, moving on to question 11. All right, this is one that I got to be honest. If I hadn't like seen this, and again, I created this on this website where it allows you to manipulate a plane to look at all the different cross sections that could be created inside of a shape. So it was really helpful to understand these. But this is one where I got to be honest, like... Um, normally most years I don't give the exam on this topic, right? But this year I'm giving it, uh, because it's, it's a good exam and, um, it's worth doing. All right. But, um, what I'm getting at is that I hadn't seen this question in previous years. And if I hadn't seen like the, this, if I hadn't seen it myself, like how to do these cross sections, I wouldn't have realized that you can make all these different shapes with a cross section of a cube. So if you you're like if you didn't realize it, which I'm sure most of you didn't either, don't feel bad because I didn't either, okay? But again, it's on here because this is on the test, all right? So um, in case you don't get like how this is working, like imagine a plane that that you're crossing with the pyramid. Like pretend this is the the plane right here. All right, you could get a triangle if you just um, intersect a portion of the plane with with uh with this with this cube okay um this one's obvious you you could get a square and remember that a square and a rectangle are types of parallelograms why am i pointing that out hmm i wonder why all right so just remember that you could get a square you could get a rectangle and those are both types of parallelograms okay now here you could also get um a pentagon first of all hold on uh, again, imagine like, um, I don't know, a flat, just a flat uh, orange or brown surface that's being stuck through the uh, cube, okay? But a pentagon, what is a pentagon? Penta means five sides. One, two, three, four, five. So that is a pentagon, okay? Over here, I put two pictures of the same thing just because... Uh, you know, this one looks more like a regular hexagon, and this one looks more like an irregular hexagon, okay? But uh, it's a hexagon because a hex means six, all right? Six sides. So one, two, three, four, five, six, all right? Um, and this one is, well, this one is easy to visualize. Like, if you visualize it this way, and right here, I have, like, this point is sticking out of this side, all right? I got to tell you, though, this one, I tried to figure out how to draw this. I'm guessing it's something like this, but it's hard for me to, uh, whoops, I didn't mean to, that should be a straight line. 
I'm guessing it's something like that, but it's, this one's a little bit hard for me to visualize how it's happening, all right? But in any case, all right, make sure you realize that all these shapes can be created from the cross section of a cube. You need to know that for the test, all right? Okay, that brings us to the last question of section two. Um, I'm sorry, the last question of section one. Sorry, guys, I'm making some uh, errors here in this video. It's kind of late when I'm recording this and uh, I'm a bit tired. All right, so um, question number 12 says, a building in the shape of a rectangular prism needs to be painted, all right? So this is a building that needs to be painted, all right? Now imagine, you know, I didn't draw this, but there's a, there's a roof on the top, all right? We're not painting the, the, the roof. We're just painting the lateral area, okay? We're only painting the lateral area of this rectangular prism. Okay, so the building has a width of 40 feet, which I wrote right here, a length of 70 feet right here, and a height of 100 feet, okay? So, they, by the way, they, they do not give you a picture. I'm adding the picture to help us analyze it, but on the test, you're not getting a picture. You can always draw your own picture, okay? You could always just go like this. It's, it's not difficult, guys. You got to make sure you have some, at least some sort of drawing skills, all right? You can leave it like that, or you could make it 3D, just put little dashes, all right? If you can't do that, you need to step up your drawing game, all right? Okay, um, so, okay, now look. It says there are 50 windows on each lateral face of the building. That means like, you know what, let me change colors because red is not really, you can't really see the red there, but that means that on this face, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously not going to draw them all, but there's like 50 windows, all right? 50 on this face, and on this face as well, 50 windows, and on the back face as well, 50 windows, and on this side as well, 50 windows. So on each lateral face of the building, there are 50 windows. And each one of those windows is a square. A square means all the sides are the same length. Measuring three feet on a side. All right, so each window is a square, three feet on a side. That means that the area would be three times three. Three squared. Okay, so the question is, write an expression, write an expression that represents the total lateral surface area in square feet that needs to be painted. In other words, write a uh, an expression for the the total lateral lateral area. The total lateral surface area would be this face, this face, the one in the back, and the one on the side. Okay. Okay. So there's two ways to do it. Let me show you the first way, which is the way that we've been doing it in all of our assignments. Okay. Um, if you use the formula for the lateral for lateral area. And that formula is lateral area equals the perimeter of the base times the height. Okay, the perimeter of the base would mean that you add up all these sides of the base. All right. So this side is 70 feet. The back part is 70 feet. This side is 40 feet. So that means that this side is 40 feet. If you add the perimeter of the base, 70 plus 40 plus 70 plus 40. Okay, that would be 220. And then you got to multiply it times the height of the rectangular prism which is 100 okay so this right here is the lateral area that needs to be painted however now we got to subtract the area of the 50 windows all right so the look look how you write the area of the 50 windows all right there's 50 of them each one of them is 3 by 3 3 times 3, okay? The area of each one is 3 squared. And since there's four faces, 1, 2, the one in the back and the one on the side, you multiply that by 4. That's where I get this from. I got to subtract that because they're not going to paint over the windows, all right? That part is not getting painted. It's the lateral surface area minus the area of the windows. Okay, now that you got that, all right, that's the way we would normally do it. That's the way we've been calculating lateral area in our homework assignments. However, that's not the way it's on the test, okay? Let me tell you how it's on the test. Here's the important part. You remember, I don't know if you guys remember, but when we started going over surface area in chapter 19.2, I mentioned a way that I, that to do it that doesn't, that's easy to remember without formulas. 
And the way would be this. Like, let's say I had to get the lateral area of this rectangular prism. Instead of using this fancy formula, I could just go like this. Okay, this is a rectangle. The area of this rectangle is 70 times 100, which is 7,000. Okay? This rectangle is the same as the rectangle in the back, so that one's also 7,000. Because you do 70 times 100. Okay? Now, this rectangle on the side right here is 40 times the height, which is 100. 40 times 100 is 4,000. And this rectangle is the same as the rectangle all the way on, on this side over here, which is also 4,000. And then you add them up, okay? That would be a way of getting a perfectly correct way of finding the uh, lateral area without using the formula, okay? So if you do it that way, this is how you could write it. And by the way, I'm, this is how it's on the test, right? So this is the important part. If you get the area of each face that makes up the lateral area of the rectangular prism, okay, you could write it like this, all right? Let me break this down so that it doesn't look confusing, all right? This part right here represents this face right here is 100 times 70, 100 times 70. And since there's two of them, the one in the front and the one in the back, you got to multiply it times two. Okay, now this one right here represents this face on the side, which is 40 times the height, which is 100. 40 times the height, which is 100. And since there's two of them, this one and, and the one on the other side, you got to multiply it times two. Okay, and in the back, you're subtracting the same thing I subtracted here, which is the area of the 50 windows on each, on each of the four sides. Okay, so just to emphasize again, this is, I wrote them both because, um, well, first of all, this is the one you need to know on the test, all right? <clears throat> but I wrote them both because this is the way we've been doing them, and I actually used this way to figure out, to make sure I knew which is the correct answer, because the way when you, when I, at least when I looked at the test, and you guys may have the same reaction, the formulas look very confusing, the way they wrote everything. They purposely wrote it all in a kind of a confusing way, in my opinion. All right, so I used this one first to figure out um, which one would give me the same thing that this gives me. Like, if I do what it says right here, it gives me the th same thing that it says right here. So that's how I was able to determine which is the correct answer. Because it may be a little difficult, a little confusing. When you see them all, all the answer choices together, it may be a little confusing to, to just randomly pick out, oh yeah, it's this one. All right, so I just wanted to make sure. Um, all right, guys, that concludes the review for section one. Next class, we're going to go over section two. Make sure to study so that you can get a, a very good grade on the exam. All right, so that's it for today. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you guys next class.